It is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, speaker, more than two million people in Ontario don't have a family doctor. The College of Family Physicians is projecting that by 2026, a quarter of Ontarians will be without a family doctor. Doctors across the province have been raising the alarm about the physician shortage, but we have heard nothing from this government about help on the horizon. There is no plan to incentivize family doctors to stay in their practices or any sign of administrative support to ease their burden. Health Force data is showing us that in Toronto, we're missing 305 family doctors. Ottawa needs 171. Barry and Muskoka, 118. And Hamilton is short 114 doctors, Speaker. So my question is to the Premier. How can you ensure continuous care is going to be available for Ontarians when thousands of people are losing their doctors every year? And to reply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, what if I told you there's a place that over, over 10,000 doctors have registered in the last five years? What, what if I told you an investment of $110 million to connect 300,000 more patients to primary care teams, they'll lead 78 new expanded teams, that will connect 98% of a population to a primary care doc. What if I told you, Mr. Speaker, if $50 billion in 50 new locations either are getting a new hospital or expanded hospital? Mr. Speaker, what if I told you there's 80,000 registered nurses here in Ontario that didn't exist five and a half years ago? Mr. Speaker, Response. this place is called Ontario, and we're going to continue building Ontario's health care team. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Order. 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 Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, I know they spent uh, millions of taxpayer dollars on those ads, so they want to get their money's worth. But what if I told you there is a province where two Order. million Ontarians cannot find a family doctor, and we have Order. a premier who is not doing his job? We are very proud, Speaker, to be joined in the House Order. today by steel workers from the great city of Sault Ste. Marie. They're here to ask for help after 10,000 patients, 10,000 patients, were notified that they're going to lose primary medical care at the Group Health Centre. The centre was founded by steelworkers. They agreed to payroll deductions to build it uh, and to support workers and their families, and it came with an agreement, Speaker, that they would receive health care for the rest of their lives. Now, with those physicians retiring or resigning, there is no one to replace them. That's the reality in the province of Ontario. There is no plan for the founding members or the historical commitment made to them. So I want to ask the Premier, what is this government doing right now to address the urgent crisis in primary care in Sault Ste. Marie? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, the primary care expansion that the Premier just mentioned, those 78 expansions and new, two of them are happening in Sault Ste. Marie. We are committed to making sure the people of Sault Ste. Marie and across Ontario have access to primary care. And that is exactly why we have invested $110 million in expanding 78 primary care teams. Now, I contrast that to a previous Liberal government who actually cut residency positions in the province of Ontario. And, Speaker, if they had not cut those residency positions, we would have upwards of 300 physicians practicing in the province of Ontario today. But we won't stop there. We will continue to work with Sault Ste. Marie, with primary care practitioners, with nurse-led practitioner clinics to make sure that access is there in community. Thank you, Speaker. 
Thank you. Final supplementary. Sir, I want to be completely clear, and I'm going to go back to the Premier on this again. 10,000 people in Northern Ontario are expected to lose primary care by May of this year. 10,000 more. 3,000 already lost it. And they're expecting another 6,000 patients to lose care. They're, they're on the brink. In total, more than a quarter of the population of Sault Ste. Marie is slated to lose access to primary care. That's unacceptable to me, and it should be unacceptable to this Premier. Yep. Speaker, the official opposition NDP is joining steelworkers and retirees in the call for an immediate strategy to recruit and deploy primary care doctors and health care professionals to Saint, Sault Ste. Marie and to other communities in Northern Ontario deeply impacted. So to the Premier, when will this government commit to the recruitment and retention strategy for health care workers in Northern Ontario? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Health. Here we started that work in 2018 when we expanded the access to nurses, to nurse practitioners, to physicians, uh, increasing their access to train in the province of Ontario. We also worked with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to make sure that as people were coming into Ontario and Canada, they were quickly assessed and ultimately approved when appropriate. You know, the member from Sault Ste. Marie has been working actively with his community to make sure that these patients are getting access. That work started immediately. I don't know where the NDP have been. I can tell you since 2018, when we formed government, that work has been expanding, and we will continue to be there for the people of Sault Ste. Marie and everyone in Ontario who wants access to a permanent The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Standing right here, raising the alarm. This government has been in power for six years, and health care is worse today than it ever has been. And that's on you. Speaker, the steelworkers of the Sioux understand the need to protect health care today and into the future. That's why they have suggested immediate solutions that will continue to pay off for years and years to come. It includes a plan to support internationally trained doctors to practice in this province, and they've called for an expert panel as well that's going to help expedite the training and mentoring that's needed to bring doctors to communities like Sault Ste. Marie. Speaker, these Order. solutions could be implemented immediately. They could have been implemented yesterday if this government had the political will to do so. So to the Premier, will he stop Order. making excuses and act now, urgently bring doctors to Sault Ste. Marie? Order. Order. Minister of Health. With the greatest of respect, Speaker, where was the party opposite when we were actually investing, when we were expanding residency positions in the province of Ontario? The opposition voted against it. Where was the opposition standing when we brought in investments, when we directed Order. the College of Physicians and Surgeons to assess and ultimately license? We now have, for the first time in the province of Ontario, as of right rules that mean if you want to practice in Ontario, you can do that without the red tape of the practice-ready physicians. It's concrete changes that we are making, that we are seeing the impact in our communities. You know, name me the last time we have expanded multidisciplinary teams by 78 in the province of Ontario. It's historic. Those are changes that are going to make a difference in communities like Chapleau, like Sault Ste. Marie, like Timmins, like Sudbury, like Innisfil, like Woodstock. Response. These are communities that are getting expansions that desperately want access to primary care, and we're giving it to them through an investment of $110 million. Fantastic. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, where are these phantom doctors? Yeah. Where are these phantom doctors? The people of Sault Ste. Marie would love to know. They would love to know. It is unacceptable, Speaker. And I'm not going to stop asking Order. this until we get an answer from this government. If these patients in Sault Ste. Marie lose access to their primary care doctors, they're going to be forced to rely Order. on those increasingly crowded emergency rooms for their basic needs. The closest emergency room outside of Sault Ste. Marie is four hours away. We, we heard today of somebody who waited 15 hours recently who was also who's lost their doctor 
Access to primary care should not depend on where we live. Across the province, I am hearing from countless, countless Ontarians who are worried about losing access to health care as well. For doctors, it's not just about staff or office spaces. It's also about housing and transportation and access to other services. It's impossible for Order. hospitals and clinics to request health care workers when there's no accessible housing or transportation. I will tell you what, I will not take lessons from the member from Sault Ste. Marie who has failed his community so badly. So badly. You, the opposition will please take her seat. Member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. Member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. You know that's why. You know, you guys three in a row. Perhaps the member for Sault Ste. Marie and the member for Kitchener Conestoga didn't hear me call them to order. The Premier can respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, what if I told you, Mr. Speaker, there is there, there's an area order. There's an area Position that, the, order. that the leader leader of the opposition really insulted the 2,400 doctors that graduated last year and called them phantom doctors. And if that applies to the all 10,000, I wonder if the 17,500 nurses, a record here in Ontario, if they're phantom nurses as well. I wonder if the new uh, universities that we're building, medical schools Member across the Hamilton province, will come are order. phantom universities. I, I wonder if the 200 160 undergraduates and 449 postgraduate seats if they're phantom seats. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering about the health care that is an all-time high right now at $81 billion. We've spent over $21 billion more in the last five years than the Liberal state has ever Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you please, please take a seat? Final supplementary, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, thank you very much. I want to use my last supplementary uh, to ask about another emerging health care issue. The, this government's privatization uh, for-profit scheme is leaving patients across this province frustrated and very, very deeply worried about being charged for medically necessary services. The Minister of Health has stood there and said that they're expanding private cataract surgeries, but we have more reports today that dozens of patients are being overbilled and charged for additional lenses and services that they did not ask for. This is exactly what we warned about. Patients being told that they will only have to use their health card are just being handed a bill for thousands of dollars after their treatment. The minister's response has been incredibly disappointing, Speaker. She recognized this practice as a violation of the Commitment to Medicare Act, but has not offered to the state any solutions to protect patients. Speaker, I'm going to ask the minister, and I don't want to hear that these patients consented to it because it's clear that patients were misled by this clinic. Minister, when will you enforce your own regulations and stop companies profiting off the backs of patients? Members will please take their seats. Order. The Minister of Health. So I think it's important to put some numbers and facts on the table, Speaker. In the province of Ontario, every single year, we have 150,000 cataract and minor surgeries happen. So over the course of two years, where the member opposite is talking about 13 complaints, we, in fact, had 300,000 minor eye surgeries and cataracts wow. in the province of Ontario. Those Speaker, those are real people. Those are real people who are now talking and yep. reading books to their grandchildren, who are now volunteering back in community, who are now back in their car driving around. We have people who are impacted when we make decisions to expand surgical and diagnostic centers in the province of Ontario. And in fact, in the last year, one single announcement that the Premier made in January of 2023 led to 17,000 additional people getting access to cataract and minor eye surgeries. Those are the facts. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwech, Speaker. Our question is to the Premier. Speaker, um, the health care system in, in Northern Ontario has uh, huge challenges. We are short hundreds of doctors and people are getting sicker. 
People are dying. This is the Ontario that I know. Two weeks ago, the Snobaski Nation declared a health state of emergency across the whole north, not just on reserves. This government doesn't have the courtesy to respond when emergencies get declared. Speaker, uh, Northern health care should not operate in a state of emergency. Will government, will you respond to the state of emergency, yes or no? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, perhaps the member opposite is not aware of the fact that, in fact, our Minister of Indigenous Affairs, our Minis Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and myself have all actively engaged in conversations and offered solutions and assistance to the people of Northern Ontario. I want to highlight, again, the expansions that we are making in Northern Ontario that will directly impact communities. Moosonian area, getting a brand new um, uh, community Winnebago area health authority team, Porcupine, Capus Casing, Sudbury, Burks Falls, Timmins, Chapleau, Wawa, Potto, Powassan. We have communities in Northern Ontario who need action from our government, and we have given it with the announcement of 78 expansions of primary care expansion teams in the province of Ontario. We will always be there with our partners Response. to make sure that we assist. But these expansions are something that I very much hope that you and your party will support when we put it in our budget. Thank you. I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The supplementary question, the member. Thank you, Speaker. In another shameful milestone for this government, Sudbury now has a private, for-profit, nurse practitioner-led clinic who charges money to patients for each and every visit. The nurse practitioner said, and I will quote her words, had the Capriol Clinic received funding to hire a permanent position, I would have likely stayed there, end of quote. Speaker, I have hand-delivered modest funding proposal from the Capriol Nurse Practitioner-led Clinic to the Minister of Health numerous times since 2021. We have underemployed nurse practitioner clinic in Northern Ontario that would love to care for us in the public system, but this government is bent into private clinics only, forcing them to go to the private sector. When? Will the Capriol Nurse Practitioner-led Clinic get the money they have been asking for since 2021? <laughs> Members, will please take their seats. Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. So when the Chaplow and District Family Health Team received an expansion in the primary care expansion announcement from last month that will serve an additional over 2,000 residents in her community, does she plan to support or vote against that initiative? 2,200 people that will get access to primary care in your own community. We have 78 examples of that across Ontario, in Thunder Bay, in Kenora and Area District. We are making the investments. What I'd like to know from the member opposite is whether they are going to support those expansions. Yeah, through the here, Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Every senior in Ontario deserves access to quality care and quality of life, both now and into the future. But, Speaker, many families, like those in my riding of Newmarket, Aurora, are concerned about the safety and well-being of their loved ones in long-term care homes. While our province already has the toughest inspection and enforcement program in Canada, we must take further action to improve compliance and provide comfort and certainty to residents and their families. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to strengthen oversight and resident safety in long-term care homes? Here, here. Good question. To reply for the government, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, the member addresses some very valid concerns for her constituents because it goes beyond just 
building long-term care homes, which this government is doing in, to a record level. It goes beyond just uh, health human resources, which this government is doing to record levels once again. It's about the safety of those in long-term care homes. And that's why since uh, I was appointed five and a half months ago, we have been working tirelessly to ensure that that is our number one priority within the long-term care setting, supported by an investment of $72.3 million. I announced uh, last month the formation of Ontario's first dedicated long-term care investigative unit. Uh, the new 10-member unit will go after the worst offenders in the long-term care system, and I want to be very clear, Speaker, I hope that they never have to be used. Speaker, these investigators have the authority to add more accountability to address the most serious forms of non-compliance so Ontarians can be sure that their loved ones are safe. Speaker, I'll repeat it in this legislature once again, our seniors took care of us. It is our turn to take care of them. Here, here. And the supplementary question. The Speaker, and it's great to hear the Minister talk about the measures our government is taking to ensure every long-term care resident lives with dignity and is offered the care they deserve. While this is an important step forward in protecting Ontario's seniors, some individuals are concerned that it will be used to punish workers in the sector. Speaker, we know that frontline staff are essential in providing quality care to residents each and every day. That's why our government must build on the progress already made and continue to invest in initiatives that will expand and enhance the long-term care workforce. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting staff in long-term care homes to deliver safe, and effective care. Good question. Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. That's very fair. And the member raises, uh, well, what's probably the most important piece of our long term care home system, and that is the hardworking frontline health care workers who make these homes homes every single day, doing the, love, the, the work for our loved ones that, frankly, many of us cannot do. Uh, Speaker, this unit is set out, and I want to be very clear on this, to go after the worst offenders and hold them to account uh, for their actions. And as I said, we hope they are never used. Service to our residents is the most important thing. That's why our government is making sure we take care of our staff and give them the tools to do their jobs better. Just last fall, we invested $300 million to recruit thousands of PSWs to the long-term care sector. In 2023 alone, we increased the local priorities fund by $35 million to support residents with complex needs. We also invested $342 million into immediate and longer-term recruitment initiatives that would add over 13,000 workers to Ontario's health care system. This includes 5,000 new and upskilled registered nurses and registered practical nurses, as well as 8,000 PSWs. Speaker, the cat's out the bag. This premier is taking care of frontline health care workers and the amazing residents within the long term care system. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the premier. Earlier this month, the mayor of Belleville declared a local state of emergency after EMS responded to 17 drug overdoses in just over 24 hours, with a total of 23 overdoses in less than 48 hours. Devastated by the loss and desperate for support, the Mayor of Belleville reached out to this Conservative government only to have the request ignored. Belleville needs $2 million to fund a local health and social services hub and a detox centre to address the ongoing addictions and overdose crisis. There is no time to wait. The community wants to see a new service hub open by the end of this year. So my question to the Premier is this. Will you immediately fund the desperately needed service hub and detox centre for Belleville? Reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, after decades of neglect by previous governments, caused addictions and support services in Ontario have rotted. They are non-existent, and it's a deeply unfortunate situation in Belleville. But unlike those governments, we take these issues seriously, and we have already taken action to alleviate the pressure on the city and have begun discussions on longer-term solutions. Last week, I joined the member for Bay of Quinte in Belleville, where we announced emergency funding to address the immediate needs of the community as identified by the CMHA. 
We're helping them increase temporary staffing at key service providers, add mental health supports for existing staff, improve security in the downtown area, and purchase new equipment for outreach teams and service providers that will help them identify and intervene early in the events of an overdose. We also met with the mayor, the first responders and healthcare agencies to talk about the situation, how we're going to work together Response. to improve mental health and addictions care in Belleville. Mr. Speaker, we have a clear agenda to ensure that we build a system that will help the people of Belleville. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. With all due respect to the Associate Minister, you have been in government for six years. The overdose crisis, the number of people dying, the service cuts has been under your watch. It's time to take responsibility and stop putting it off on somebody else. <laughs> Belleville desperately needs adequate funding to build and operate a local service hub, not measly one-time funding. They need reliable, continuous support to address the addictions and overdose crisis. The community has been asking, pleading for this funding for months, with no answer from this government. It's not a tough ask, as the Conservative member for that riding and the Associate Minister told the Mayor. What's tough is watching our family members and our community members overdose and die in the streets. Last week, the Premier acknowledged the need to urgently fund mental health and addiction supports, but the people of Belleville still have no commitment for a much-needed service hub and detox centre in their community. So I ask the Premier again. Will you honour your promise about increasing supports by immediately funding the construction and operation of a local health and social services hub and detox centre in Belleville? Yes or no? Members, so please take your seats and I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'd like to point out to my colleague at the other, on the other side of the House, just where we are, and to suggest that we haven't done anything in the last six years. Mr. Speaker, this is the first government to have Order. a minister responsible for mental health and addiction. The first government Order. to invest historic amounts in mental health and addictions. And let's just start with where we began. How about the fact that you closed 13 per cent of Ontario's mental health beds and 9,645 hospital beds? How about the fact that you're the ones that created the doctor shortage in the first place? How about the fact that you cut $53 million at, in mental health supports when you were in power? How about the fact that you voted against the roadmap for Opposition wellness come to and order. did not provide the support to the government in ensuring that we built the system of care? Windsor West, Mr. come Speaker, to order. We need a continuum of care, not piecemeal solutions. What we are doing as a government is ensuring that that continuum is for is Hamilton built, Mountain, come not to only order. in Belleville, but everywhere across the province of Ontario. We've opened 400 beds, 7,000 treatment spots. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Yay! Ontario's agricultural and food industry contributes over $48 billion to our province's GDP and our economy. In my riding of Brantford Brant, there are over 1,400 agri food businesses that all serve a vital role in contributing to Ontario's economic prosperity and job creation. That's why it is criti of critical importance that our government supports measures that strengthen and grow this vital sector. People in my riding were thrilled to hear the minister first announce the Grow Ontario strategy to expand production and enhance efficiency. Speaker, can the minister please provide the House with an update on what our government is doing to implement the strategy and ensure we are supporting the agriculture and food sector? Thank you. 
To reply, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member from Brantford Brant very much because it allows us to stand in this house to share with everyone and to those watching live that our Grow Ontario strategy is working. For example, we had put out in our strategy that we wanted to increase exports of Ontario grown and produced food by 30 per cent by the year 2020. And, uh, you know, essentially, in 2022 and 2023, we've actually increased exports by 20.9 per cent. Ladies and gentlemen, our plan is working. Furthermore, research is so important, and we need to continue to innovate. And our strategy set out that we wanted to see more than 250 patents and licenses realized by the year 2032. Response. And through to 2022 to the end of 2023, we actually saw 43 patents and licenses realized through funding by the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Our strategy is on the mark and it's working. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Speaker, from the Minister's response, it's clear that our government has committed to tangible actions that will ensure the continuous growth of the agri-food sector in Ontario. Speaker, agri-food businesses in my community and across the province expect their government to implement measures that are innovative and will address their needs. It's critical that our government ensures that these industries have access to new processes and new equipment and new technology to expand production and enhance efficiency. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update on some of the actions and results of the new Grow Ontario strategy? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, I really am pleased and proud to share with you that not only are farmers responding to the importance and the need to drive innovation for, to realize efficiencies and increased yields, but our processors are as well, and our programs are hitting the mark. And just last week, I was in Strathroy and I visited Norterra. It's a processing plant that specializes in frozen vegetables, and they actually have plants in Strathroy, Ingersoll, and Tecumseh in southwestern Ontario, and they process 635 million pounds of frozen vegetables. And last year, they actually invested in new technologies to drive line efficiencies that ultimately uh, resulted from a new enhanced bagging and scale piece of equipment. This spring, based on success, they're Pause. actually investing in new optical sorting equipment that will drive continued product quality. Again, Speaker, our strategy to grow Ontario is working, and it's— Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Natural Resources, through you, Speaker. As you know, the mill in Terrace Bay has been idled since January. I have met with the union leadership, mayors, First Nations chiefs, our provincial and federal representatives, and small business owners in Terrace Bay and Scriber, and nothing has happened to slow down the potential social and economic collapse of these communities. There are 500 direct lost jobs, but 1,900 jobs at risk throughout the region. Given that the owners of the mill won't communicate beyond saying they will entertain offers of purchase, I'm wondering what update the government can share with these workers about their plans to address this issue. The uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. And, and first and foremost, our thoughts are with those workers in Terrace Bay in that mill that has been idled, and we want to get them back to work as soon as possible. That's why, Mr. Speaker, the moment that this happened, we started outreach not only to the workers but to the mayors of the affected communities all through the sector to make sure that we have opportunities that are uh, presented to us to work with the owners, to work with the sector, to find a way to get this mill back up and running again. Speaker, we know that the forestry sector is a very integrated sector, and when something like this happens, it can cause challenges all throughout the sector. We are leaving no stone unturned to find a way to get this mill back open, whether it's with the current owner or whether it's with another operator. We know that the future Bonds. of forestry in Northern Ontario still 
still remains bright. We will find ways to get over this hurdle and continue to make Northern Ontario a strong powerhouse that it deserves to be. Supplementary question. Uh, back to the minister. Thank you for that response. The company received almost $130 million in provincial grants, yet they don't appear to have any responsibility toward the workers or toward remediating the extensive pollution they are leaving behind. Who is going to ensure that the company does not get away with leaving a huge cleanup liability for a potential buyer or the community of Terrace Bay? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, we continue to work with ownership of the mill to ensure that everything remains compliant and that this mill opens again. The single best thing that can happen is that this mill opens again, continues to produce the products that make Northern Ontario strong through a, uh, the integrated forestry sector, and we can work through the challenges you know, that exist today and to a future tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, this government continues to invest in the forestry sector in Ontario. We'll make no bones about that. We want to ensure that this sector is very strong in the Northwest, in the Northeast, and all throughout the integrated, as, and I'll use that word many, many times, integrated forestry sector that exists in this province. It is one of the backbones of our province economy and 142,000 people work in this sector. We're making investments every day, whether it's through our biomass program, Response. our forestry innovation program, to ensure that opportunities continue to exist in forestry in Ontario now and well into the future. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, for the Premier, 60 seconds isn't enough time to list this government's failures in health care, but let's give it a try. What if I told you emergency room wait times are the worst they've ever been and ER closures have become the norm? That's because we're losing family doctors faster than we're gaining them, and thousands Order. of patients are losing uh, primary care overnight. Order. On top of that, Bill 124 has shattered our workforce for nothing. They sure got that done, and there's still no health care worker retention plan. So now, Temporary staffing agencies have stepped in and are burning a hole in our hospitals Order. and long-term care homes. But the Premier says just let it burn. Government side, As a result, order. hospital debts are ballooning and they're being forced to rely on high-interest loans because this government does not have their back. And now, desperate patients are being forced to turn to private, for-profit clinics that are overcharging elderly patients while this government turns a blind eye. Mr. Question. Speaker, why should this government trust any of the Premier's promises when all he has to show for his efforts is this long list of health care woes? Premier? M Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know, as I, I said, before your government destroyed the health care system here in Ontario. Absolutely. You, you Absolutely. fired, Mr. Speaker, they fired 1,600 nurses. Order. We've registered 80,000 nurses, 17,500 last year alone. Mr. Speaker, they were so dysfunctional, the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, wouldn't even Order. speak to them. Wow. They, they shut down hospital beds like we've never seen. They created hallway health care, Mr. Mr. Speaker. What Ottawa we've done, South, come to order. What, what we've done, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we've added 3,500 beds. Yeah. We're adding another 3,000 beds. We've added 10,000 doctors. We've added 80,000 registered Fox. nurses. We're building universities that are going to create the next doctors. Order. Premier will take a seat. Premier will take a seat. The member for Ottawa South will put the cards back in his wallet. Supplementary question. Member for Don Valley East. While the Premier loves to fall back on, liberal, on the Liberal mismanagement distraction, he does nothing but highlight his own mismanagement, which is quite frankly beyond comparison. You know, Mr. Speaker, the government loves to brag about all the money it spent on health care, but what does it have to show for it? You wouldn't see me bragging about spending millions of dollars on a car that doesn't start. 
This government has created a problem that it cannot Order. fix. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to Order. all Ontarians. They're not thinking about your future. They're thinking about their future. They don't care about bringing your emergency room wait times down, and they don't care about emergency room closures. They don't care about keeping your family doctor or your nurse practitioner. They don't care about anything unless someone is making a profit. Whether it's temporary nursing agencies, private for-profit clinics, developers drooling over the green belt, private companies like Staples, Shoppers Drug Mart, and Loblaws, this government will always lead with greed. Mr. Speaker, when will this government realize they could give the people of Ontario so much more if they'd only focus on people, not profits? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Oh, Speaker, let's do a bit of compare and contrast, shall we? Yeah. Liberals, Liberal government cut residency positions shame, in the province shame, of Ontario. Shame, shame. Conservative government actually expands residency positions and, and two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, in, in Brampton and in Scarborough. Your previous order. The previous Liberal Premier acknowledged, after you were defeated, that her biggest regret was how she decimated the health care system. It was your Premier and your leader who said that. Order. Why don't you take the credit card out of your leader $4,000 pride of purse? <laughs> I apologize to the Minister of Health. I had to interrupt because I couldn't hear what she was saying because of the noise in the house. I'm going to ask the member for Ottawa South to come to order and the government house leader to come to order. Is there still time for the Minister of Health to conclude? Order. Start the clock. Minister of Health. Thank you. You know, the numbers show that we are investing more in health care in the province of Ontario, and we did that, Speaker, without raising taxes. How did we do that? We did that by expanding the economy to make sure that more people are working in the province of Ontario, to make sure that people are investing in the province of Ontario. And by doing that, Response. we've been able to invest and expand the health care budget by over $20 billion. Order. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Like many provinces, Ontario is in a housing supply crisis, which has been decades in making. One of the key areas we need to see improvement is in purpose-built rental housing. Due to excessive red tape and high construction costs, Fewer rental units have been built over the past 40 years. In fact, over 80% of the Ontario purpose-built rental units were built before 1980. That's why our government must continue to take action to ensure we are improving rental housing construction across the province. Speaker, can the minister please update the House on the progress our government has made on purpose-built rental housing? To reply, the Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, uh, for that question. Know that Ontario set a new record in 2023 on purpose built rental housing. It was the largest in our history, even above 2022, which is a record. CMHA says that we got nearly 19,000 new starts last year, up 27%, but we know. We know, Speaker, that much more is to be done in that arena and also in all types of housing construction. But results count, and our actions are working. We've lowered development charges, we've reduced red tape and the costs associated with it, and we've removed the HST on purpose-built rentals thanks to the Minister of Finance and the Premier for advocating in Ottawa a job well done. Speaker, there's much more to do. We know there is, but the best is yet to come. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, I thank the Associate Minister for the response. It is great to hear how our government is building more new homes 
and getting them built faster. Speaker, my constituents were pleased to hear that we are committed to building 120,000 new homes in Mississauga as part of our plan to build 1.5 million homes by 2020, 2031. But, Speaker, we know that the former mayor failed to address the housing supply crisis in the city. Under Boney Crombie to Nur, Mississauga only hit 27 per cent of its 10 years target, one of the worst records in Ontario. The people of Order. Mississauga deserve stronger leadership to help them achieve their dreams of home ownership. Question. Speaker, can the, can the minister tell the House how Boney Crombie anti-housing agenda has made it harder to build homes in Mississauga? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, uh, the record is clear. Mayor Crombie had the worst housing record in the province of Ontario. Allow me to give you some examples. Last May, Mississauga wouldn't approve an application for nearly 4,700 units. Why? Because the buildings were too tall. Shadows? <laughs> Next, Mayor Crombie also blocked 703-unit housing proposal that would replace a strip mall. Why? She went on record to say she opposed the building because her favorite bakery was in the mall. <laughs> prevented thousands Order. of people of having a roof over their head. Why, Speaker? Shadows Order. and cake? Good gracious. Have a croissant, please. Uh, Speaker, spots. Mayor Crombie's housing wow. record was abysmal. Wow. Speaker, Ontario families wow. cannot afford Bonnie Crombie. The next question. The member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Ontario colleges and universities are bracing for the impact of a 50 per cent reduction in international study permits at a time when the sector is already at a breaking point. This was detailed in the Blue Ribbon Panel report, which highlighted decades of chronic underfunding and years of declining provincial grants. Speaker, does this Premier understand? And how critical post-secondary institutions are to our province's well-being and prosperity, and will he commit to providing the urgent funding needed immediately to keep our colleges and universities afloat? And to reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. But quite frankly, we were very disappointed with the federal government, who did no consultations whatsoever with the provinces. And I, I ask you today, what have you done to stand up and advocate for more seats in this province? I've heard from members all across my side and from Mr. Min ministries the impact this is going to have on our economy. At Roma, I had an opportunity to meet with the tourism industry who were saying they're going to be devastated without these students. It is going to be such an impact on the economy. That's why when we're working with the federal government on the allocations, we will be looking at the labour market needs across regions in Ontario as number one priority. Also ensuring that there is guaranteed housing for students, international students coming to our campus will be a priority, and ensuring that the economic needs of each region is a concern as well. But Mr. Speaker, this is going to be an impact across Ontario, and the federal Response. government did absolutely no consultations with the provinces nor with the sector. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The supplementary question, the member for London West. Speaker, the federal announcement was last month. We've had years, we've had decades of right. chronic underfunding by this government and the Liberals before them, which has put our post-secondary institutions starved for resources, and now they are on the brink. Uh, Ontario has had the lowest per-student funding in Canada uh, since, since they started keeping statistics, spending half or less of what other provinces do. We have at least 10 universities and now many colleges facing deficits, which is going to put the sector and our communities at risk. Students are already struggling with cuts to OSAP and cuts to student supports and services. They should not be expected to cover this government's failure to properly fund with tuition increases. Speaker, what exactly is this government's plan to keep Ontario's colleges and universities solvent and sustainable. Yeah.
to respond. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what I want to say is what we are doing for students under the leadership of this Premier is keeping tuition affordable for students here, across here. the province. This is not a burden that's going to be on the backs of students. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Blue Ribbon Panel for their recommendations and for the hard work they've been doing. And as I've said, we will be, having, we'll be announcing our uh, path forward shortly. But Mr. Speaker, when we look at the impact that this is going to have from the, the federal government's decision, this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade comes here every week with a new company wanting to come to Ontario. And why is that? Because of the skilled labour force that we have in this province. I've talked to our colleges and universities about the impact it's going to have. I was at Fanshawe College recently with the member from the area, and we heard directly from them. Volkswagen came here to the area because of the skilled labour market. Fanshawe is concerned about that. I've talked to Georgian College in my own neighbourhood, talking Response. about the impact it's going to have on hospitality and tourism in our region. This is going to be a huge impact, and the fact that the federal government did this with absolutely zero consultation with the provinces and the post-secondary institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question. The next question, the matter, member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Ontario has records for nearly 27,000 oil and gas wells, with a number of them located in my riding of Chatham Kent Leamington. In 2021, a devastating explosion occurred in the village of Wheatley because of gas that surfaced through an abandoned well in the area. It was heartbreaking that 20 people were injured from my community and several buildings severely damaged. Our government has since taken a robust action in helping my community rebuild and heal, but we must continue to come together, overcome challenges, and ensure residents in my riding and across Ontario have a bright and safe future. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to tackle risks posed by inactive oil and gas wells? Good question. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Chatham Camp Leamington for the question. Boy, he's doing a great job for his constituents every day, including the people in Wheatley. I know they really appreciate it. Uh, Speaker, recently I had a chance to be in Norfolk with my friend uh, Mayor Martin and her council and members of the uh, fire and rescue staff there for a great announcement, a $2 million announcement supporting municipalities throughout southwestern Ontario, allowing them to purchase protective equipment like gas monitoring equipment to ensure plugged gas wells remain safe, providing training to emergency responders, making investments customized to their community that matter most. And I just highlight Wheatley uh, again, Mr. Speaker, because uh, recently Chatham Kent Fire and Rescue have been handing out uh, personal uh, protective of gas monitors for homes and resident uh, of the town Kelly Addison said it's nice to have an alarm so we feel safe and those alarms are being paid for using a provincial grant from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, Bonds. it's all about keeping people safe in their communities and making investments that matter like the $23.6 million in our... Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to the Minister for his response and for personally coming to my community several times to listen to, work with experts, and take decisive action. It's reassuring to see our government is committed to keeping communities safe. With this investment, communities like Wheatley will be able to prevent petroleum-related emergencies in the future and to deliver better protection for all of Ontario. The dangers of old oil and gas wells as evident from my community, are serious and ongoing. Our government must continue to do all we can to reduce risks and ensure that our plan addresses our municipal's needs, municipality's needs. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is working to improve both emergency preparedness and risk prevention for communities across Ontario? Question. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks again for the question. And as I was saying, uh, you know, the geology of Southwest Ontario is unique, and it presented opportunities, but also presents safety challenges and risks that are unique to that part of the province of Ontario. That's why, Mr. Speaker, $23.6 million, as I said in my first answer, is being invested to ensure safety for those residents, to plug more wells, more than the opposition ever considered plugging when they were on the case, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker. And for example, we're doing more on the innovation side too to get ahead of this. Six million dollars for scientific studies and research to improve our understanding of these wells while providing better risk mitigation for our teams on the ground. Mr. Speaker, we know there's always more work to do on this file. We'll continue to engage with municipalities, landowner, industry, indigenous communities, the public, as we work to ensure the safety Spons. of those in southern Ontario that are counting on us, and we're delivering. The member for Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. On February 1st and 2nd, Kirkland Lake and Temiskaming Shores OPP and enforcement officers from the MTO did a commercial safety blitz on trucks. I'd like to thank the officers. I'd like to thank all the truckers who actually run a safe rig in the companies. But on February 1st and 2nd, 75 trucks were pulled over for inspection. 36 were pulled off the road for safety, pulled off the road. Nearly half the trucks on the Trans-Canada Highway that day were pulled off the road under the minister's watch. Mm. What, is that acceptable? Mm. <laughs> to respond, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we have increased enforcement all across uh, the province, especially focusing on the north. Mr. Speaker, safety is, safety is a top priority for this government, and I thank those uh, hardworking officers and MTO officials that are on the on the roads and making sure that our roads are safe. We have some of the safest roads in all of North America. We will continue to do whatever we can to have the highest standards of training, highest standards of road safety, as we have done, whether that be investing in critical infrastructure, expanding highways, uh, investing in keeping those highways safe, like Highway 17. And I'm very proud of the work that those officers have done to keep those uh, uh, streets safe and continue to have that compliance and, uh, and enforcement uh, across our highways, especially in the north, Mr. Speaker. Safety is a top priority, and we will do whatever we can to keep the people of this province safe, especially on our roads and especially our truck drivers and those who travel on those Response. roads. Response. The supplementary question. Thanks, Speaker. Thanks for that answer. With all due respect, so on February 1st and 2nd, half the trucks on the Trans-Canada were unsafe in a blitz. So it's safe to assume that the other days, like today, also half of them are unsafe. And another little statistic for Temiskaming. If your car is registered in the district of Temiskaming, you're four times as likely to die in an accident than if it's registered in Toronto. Wow. So once again, this was a blitz. But what about when the blitzes aren't happening? What is this government going to do to ensure that all trucks are safe on the Trans-Canada, not just half? Thank you, Speaker. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to that member, we've actually had a blitz going, uh, especially in the north, with a targeted fo focus since July of this year, Mr. Speaker. It's been a plan that we have listened to and, and looked at uh, the concerns by many um, in the industry and in, uh, increased enforcement uh, across the north, Mr. Speaker. It's also why we're investing three, over $3 billion in improving our roads every single year. And Mr. Speaker, every measure that we've taken, whether it's been adding more lights, uh, expanding lanes, the two plus one pilot that we were running in the north for increased safety, those members right there have voted against it every single time. When it comes to safety, Order. when it comes to increasing enforcement, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to increasing the number of officers that we have on the road, the NDP and Liberal have voted against those safety measures every step of the way. That's unacceptable, Mr. No Speaker. Response? This government will continue to invest in, in our enforcement officers, will continue to invest in making our roads safer and the necessary improvements that are needed to support that safety. The next question, the member for Oakville, North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. We know that supporting more women in the workforce benefits Ontario's economy, especially in in-demand sectors such as the skilled trades. At the present time, the number of women employed in the skilled trades is well below their male counterparts. In 2022, women accounted for only 8.1 per cent of the labour force in trades, transport and related occupations in Ontario. 
That's why it is critical for our government to continue to invest in programs that break down barriers for women so that they have the tools they need to join the workforce. Speaker, can the Associate Minister highlight some of the ways our government is expanding opportunities for women to find good work and good pay in the skilled trades? Great question. The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member from Oakville, North Burlington, for the question. It's good to be back in the House and to share some of the amazing things that women are building across Ontario, from being 10,000 feet deep in a mine in Timmins and talking to the skilled women working underground, from discussions with the Chambers of Commerce and Boards of Trade in North Bay, in Brockville, Kitchener, just to name a few of the ridings that I've had the privilege to visit. I heard how women are being empowered and are helping to build a strong Ontario together. Alongside these women, our government is working to build women's economic opportunities and increase their safety through financial independence. And that's why I was very pleased to recently announce the expansion and call for applications for the Women's Economic Security Program, which will bring us closer Bonds. to that goal. Here, here. And the supplementary question. Thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. It is encouraging that our government is focused on investments and initiatives that will support women to become economically secure and independent. Speaker, Ontario is facing the largest labour, sto labour shortage in a generation. With thousands of jobs going unfilled in the skilled trades, it's critical that we provide supports for women to pursue fulfilling and good-paying careers in these sectors. Can the Associate Minister share with the House how our government is expanding and increasing training opportunities for women? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the Women's Economic Security Program provides training for low-income women to equip them with the skills, the knowledge, and the experience to get a job. And to ensure their success, participants can also access wraparound supports. Since its inception in 2018, we know this program has been working because the Women's Economic Security Program has helped thousands of women either start a business or get a job in the skilled trades. So it's time to build on these results. And I'm very pleased to announce that our government is increasing the investment to this program by a half a million dollars, bringing our total investment this year to 5.5 million. And that marks nearly a 10% increase to the program this year alone. So this will allow more women across Ontario to access the supports they need to enter or re-enter the workforce, build rewarding careers, and increase their safety through financial independence. Because in Ontario, we truly believe that when women succeed, Ontario succeeds. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. I have two members who uh, want to raise points of orders. I understand the first one, member for Ottawa, Vanier. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am seeking unanimous consent that notwithstanding standing order uh, 100A4, five minutes be allotted to the independent members as a group to speak during private members' public business today. Madam Collard is seeking the unanimous consent of the House that notwithstanding Standing Order 100A4, that five minutes be allotted to the independent members as a group to speak during private members' public business today. Agreed? No. I heard a no. The member for Sudbury has a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to do an introduction for the steelworkers who came down from St. Marie. They weren't able to be here in time for introductions this morning. I want to welcome uh, District Director Miles Sullivan. Uh, Assistant Director Kevin Stewart, uh, Bernie Thorpe of the Steelworkers Organization of Active Retirees, and from USW 2251, Joe Krimop Krimop Joe K. You know I know your name, Joe Krimopaj, <laughs> Rebecca McCracken, uh, Hans De Fader. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Steelworkers make great leaders. Being no further business this morning, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>